Well, it is good to be preaching again. When you haven't preached for a while, you get a bit itchy. Um, so it's nice to be back up front again. Um, and as far as the narrative journey's been going, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've been working through the Gospel of Mark since, uh, well, actually the last Sunday in December, the Sunday after Christmas. And uh, this is week five now. So, so far, um, you've journeyed with uh, different people, Kevin, and different people, and Kevin's done a great job in introducing uh, the broad themes of Mark to you and the characteristics of what makes the Gospel of Mark different from the other Gospels. But if you've been on holidays like me and have missed all those sermons, do you want me to give you a three-minute catch-up of uh, what's been said so far? Mark was written by John Mark, uh, or in the name of John Mark, we're not quite sure, uh, but John Mark was the person... Um, he was a young person during the time of Jesus. He was possibly the young man who fled naked in Mark chapter 14. Uh, but we certainly know that he was a companion of Paul and Barnabas in Acts. And uh, Mark was the first gospel written um, out of the four that we have in the Bible and uh, was plagiarised by uh, Matthew and Luke. There's large chunks of Mark that's just been copied straight over into those other two Gospels. And um, as Kevin explained it last week, um, uh, the, one of the weeks, it's, it's a little bit like a newspaper report or a breaking news report. It, it just gives you the, the story, the facts of the story. And there's not a whole lot of explanation or uh, reflection in the Gospel of Mark. It really is, here's what happened. And then this is what happened. And then this is what happened. Kevin actually mentioned one of the, the key words in Mark is the word immediately. Immediately. Um, because it's almost like immediately Jesus did this. And then he immediately went off and did this. And immediately this happened. And it's almost like that breaking story, you know, that it's always just moving along. So it's, it's fast paced. It's, it feels short, sharp and snappy as we move through Mark. So, in short, you would say that Mark just tells the story of Jesus. And there's not a whole lot of theology around that. It's just, here's the story of Jesus. Here's the story of Jesus. Which is both good and bad. Both good and bad. It's good in the sense that it's good for people who just want to ask the question, who is this Jesus? And often, uh, if a person is asking those sort of questions or wants to read the Bible for the first time, we would say, read the Gospel of Mark first, because it's an easy book to read. But it's also not very good, because it doesn't answer a whole lot of questions. It raises a lot of questions, and then just moves on. Whereas some other books go a little bit deeper into trying to reflect upon that, Mark doesn't. And today's reading is a good example of that, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. One of the other key things I was taught in Bible college about the Gospel of Mark is that it's sort of like split into two different sections, um, all uh, sort of like leading to a point um, that separates these two sections. So the first eight chapters are, are a barrage worth of three years worth of stories about Jesus, what Jesus was doing and what Jesus was saying, mainly in Galilee. And, you know, the people were amazed and wondered at what Jesus was doing um, during this time. And one of the key questions they were asking is, who is this man? Who is this man? Like when Jesus um, calmed the seas, the disciples said, who is this man who can control the wind and the waves? Who is this man? And so it keeps building up these stories, one after the other and the after the other and you, you get to a point in Matthew chapter 8 28 when Jesus asks uh, the question well who do people say that I am and and the disciples sort of go well have you not been around <laughs> for the first eight chapters that's what everybody is asking who are you they're trying to work it out who are you and then Jesus asked the questions of the disciple but what about you who do you say that I am? And we have that amazing declaration by Peter. You are the Messiah. 
You are the one. You are the one that we've been waiting for. You are the one who has come to help. You are the one who has come to save. You are the Messiah. And it's almost like it's that verse that the whole gospel pivots on. Because everything up to that point is, who is this man? And as soon as we hit Matthew, uh, Luke, Mark, blah, 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 Mark 8, 28, the gospel changes into going, all right, now you know that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's show you what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. And we get things like the transfiguration. We get uh, the Easter narratives with Jesus' death and resurrection. And so can you sort of see how the gospel split in two and really split in two over that key question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Well, that makes sense so far. I actually found a really nice poster. I couldn't quite fit it on the screen that sort of describes how the narrative lectionary has split up that journey in those different areas. But we can sort of see from this poster the journey so far that we've covered stories like uh, the healing of the paralytic, the baptism of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus that included the parable of the sower and the parable of the wineskins. And last week you crossed over to the other side of the lake where you met uh, the demon-possessed man whom Jesus healed. And the reading we get to today is that Jesus has come back to this side of the lake, uh, to the Galilee side of the lake, where a huge crowd is waiting for him, including the synagogue leader Jairus, whose daughter is dying, and an unnamed woman who'd been suffering with her health issue for 12 years. Now, I'm assuming you've heard this story before, have you? Who sort of went when you heard the Bible reading, oh, not again? It's a good story, don't get me wrong. But we do hear it a bit, don't we? Because it's one of those classic stories that is good for the Sunday school kids' age, right through to, to all ages. And so we hear it lots. It's always in the curriculum for uh, scripture teaching in the schools. Um, it's a story that we use there a lot. Um, and it comes up in, in our Bible readings in sermons a bit as well. So I'm making an assumption that you've probably heard this story before, you've probably heard somebody teaching this before, and you've probably even heard a sermon from me about it before. So what are we going to do today then? How do we find new insights out of this passage today if we've heard it so many times? I did a bit of reading and listening to podcasts and research in the lead up to my preparation and I found that some of the different ideas or approaches that people were using for this passage sort of fell into three broad areas or broad ideas and I think that they're all good and valid and so instead of me just preaching uh, one sermon today I was wondering whether I can preach three really short sermonettes instead and give you three different perspectives on this passage. And just let God speak to you through whatever is right for you. So you might find one of them or two of them, you might go, no, I didn't get anything out of that. That's fine. I'm hoping that one of the three, at least, God will speak to you uh, today. Is that all right? You ready for this? You guys going well at the front? All right. The first one I would entitle something like, uh, the power of Jesus to heal. Um, and this is the one that we often would teach to kids. And John in his kids talk was perfect because he did this sermon in his kids talk, this idea. And it would go something like this, that uh, Jesus had a mission. He came to earth um, to be the Messiah. And, and he was fairly focused on that mission in the Gospel of Mark. But Jesus was also compassionate and was willing to be interrupted in that mission to help people who called out for help or who needed help. And so whilst Jesus was declaring the kingdom of God is near, you know, when Jairus came up and said, my daughter is sick, Jesus goes, all right, let, let me help. <laughs> He's willing to be interrupted because of his compassion. When the suffering woman reached out to Jesus on the way, Jesus stopped, was willing to be interrupted again because someone needed help and she was healed. 
And even when they got to Jairus' house with the news that his daughter had died, he said, don't be afraid, just believe. And calling upon the power of God, Jesus went in there and then where the child was, took her hand and said, little girl, get up. And she did. And the good news of this sermon would say that Jesus is still compassionate and Jesus still has the power of, to heal. So if we just believe like Jesus tells us to and reach out to Jesus like that woman did in faith, then we too will experience the healing of Jesus in our lives. Do I get an amen for that? Thanks, Bill. It's a good message, isn't it? And it's basically what John did in the kids' talk, that Jesus has the power to heal. I've actually preached a sermon like that here in 2018. Do you remember it? You will, because I brought in the shawl. Do you remember the Jewish shawl? And I talked about the tassels and the healing in the wings. Now you remember it. <laughs> so I've preached that sermon here, that exact same style of sermon. It's a good sermon, but it's not the only way to approach this passage. The second approach could be entitled, Jesus wants to holistically heal. This sermon affirms what the first sermon said, that Jesus is compassionate and has the power to heal, but goes a little bit further a bit deeper into the story in the light of the culture of the time. And it would go something like this. In the Jewish culture, when a person was bleeding, including the normal menstrual cycle, that person was ritually unclean. And when you are ritually unclean, you have to isolate while um, you are ritually unclean for seven days uh, before rejoining society again. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years constantly and I cannot even begin to imagine what it must have been like for her to be socially isolated for 12 years. So it was a risk for her to draw close to this crowd when she saw that Jesus was coming but she took that risk because she wanted to be healed. When Jesus was coming by she didn't make a noise or call out to him because that would have highlighted the fact that she was there, which she wasn't supposed to be. And so she quietly reaches out to Jesus, trying not to be noticed. But if this is the case, why did Jesus stop and make her in the spotlight? Jesus should have known this. And when he felt the power go from him, he should have just gone, all right, I'll just let her slip away healed. But he doesn't. He goes, who's touched me? Puts her in the spotlight so everybody notices that she is there. Makes her the centre of what was happening. Why? I think it's because Jesus didn't want to just provide physical healing to her, but something deeper. A holistic healing a healing of her place in society. By showing to the crowd that she had been healed, Jesus was telling the community, she is no longer unclean. Do not reject her anymore. She is to be re-embraced back into the family. And he highlights this by that interesting phrase that he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Did anyone notice that? He could have said, woman, your faith has made you well. But he says, daughter. There's something in it about saying, you are no longer isolated. You are no longer excluded. You are no longer an outcast. You are part of the family. Daughter, your faith has made you well. When Jesus said, you are now free from your suffering, he was not just talking about her bleeding, but everything else, the isolation, the loneliness, the rejection. She is a daughter, part of the community and part of God's family. And the good news of this sermon would be that God offers that to us today as well. Jesus is highlighting that the healing that Jesus brings is not only physical but holistic. Actually, I would argue that Jesus is probably keener to offer holistic healing 
than physical healing. If you go back to uh, the uh, paralytic being lowered down through the ceiling, Jesus was more interested in your sins are forgiven. And then it was an extra thing to add on, yeah, get up and walk. The holistic feeling, healing came first in that situation. And Jesus offers us, us healing, that same healing to us too. A healing that might be more about our peace for an, our anxiety or soothing for our emotional scars or encouraging our souls as much as it is healing our body. Do I get an amen for that one? Oh, I've got a few more for that one. <laughs> it's a good message too. And yes, I have preached a sermon like that here as well in 2022, only last, uh, a bit over a year ago. No, March 2022. So that was about 18 months ago. Do you remember it? Oh, <laughs> someone remembers it already. Um, yeah, so I have preached a sermon like that as well. And I think there's something powerful in that message that God might speak to us today. But there is another approach as well, and I haven't preached this one here. But it's one that God really spoke to me through my preparation that sort of, sort of resonated with me and where I am at at the moment. And it could be entitled Healing and the Reality of Life. And this idea was spurred by a podcast I was listening to when one of the contributors said, this passage reminds me of a fairy tale where Jesus waves his magic wand and everything turns out the way it wants to. She, she was not being, you know, mean about the passage. She was just sort of saying, it's one of those passages where, you know, it all turns out right. It all turns out right. Like we don't want people to suffer. We don't want little children to die. And this story warms our hearts because it turns out the way we want it to be. The woman does get healed. The child is brought back to life. Everybody is happy at the end and it's a good story. The problem, she said in the podcast, is that life is not always like this. And she went on to say, this is a great story to teach in Sunday school because it talks about the power of Jesus. But to the parent whose child has died, this story is very conflicting. And I have to admit, reading this passage where I'm at, at the moment, this story is a bit conflicting. Because, you know, last year when I was sitting with my sister who was suffering and dying from cancer, I would have loved for Jesus to bring healing to her. I did pray for that. And I prayed that everything would be right again. I did reach out to Jesus. But unlike the story, my sister was not healed. Nor was she brought back to life after she had died. So in the podcast I was listening to, the um, host said to the contributor, so what do we do with this passage then? Do we just uh, mark it down as a nice story but totally irrelevant to our situation today? What do you think of that question? Is this passage irrelevant to us? I really liked the contributor's answer when she said, no, this passage is relevant, she said. She said, I just have to sit with the tension on one hand, believing that God is a healing God, and on the other hand, understanding that this is not the way that life always turns out. She said, I sit in the tension between the two of those. And she's right. That's what we do. But it, it is conflicting. Sometimes we pray and people are healed and sometimes we pray and it feels like there's no evidence of any healing at all. Sometimes we find ourselves seeing God's power clearly at work. There's no doubt. And other times we struggle to see any evidence at all. And so we find ourselves sitting in this tension and yet we still have the ability to cling to our faith. We find ourselves not being afraid but instead still believing. 
whatever ways things might go. Is that a good message? Is there an amen for that one? I hope so. But can you see how this passage can speak differently to different people? So I guess the question I have this morning is, what is God saying to you this morning? There's three different messages there and I'm, I'm hoping that God is speaking through at least one of those. Do you resonate with the good news that these stories that Jesus is compassionate and knows you and knows the situation that you are in and will stop, is willing to be interrupted to focus on you and has the power to heal? Is that what you need to hear today? Or maybe you're stirred by the message of holistic healing. Maybe Jesus wishes to bring you peace to your mind or, or healing to your soul as much or even more than physical healing today. Or maybe you're sitting with the tension between our belief in Jesus' power to heal and the struggle that we are not always experiencing that and yet finding the faith to not be afraid and to believe whatever is happening. Whatever message that God is speaking to you today, I hope that you then link that back into the bigger question that I mentioned at the beginning, the bigger question of the Gospel of Mark. How is this passage helping you answer the question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say Jesus is? And wherever God is stirring you this morning, I pray that we can respond. Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the one who has come to help me. You are the one who knows me, knows my heart, and is here for me this morning. Amen.